We are being taped and broadcast live tonight by, as we have now dubbed, our director-producer, Oz. So, thank you for that. And if you missed part of last night's public hearing, that was Oz's fault also. So. <laughs> wow. Anyway. Oh, shade over Well, that's all right. <laughs> Wait a second. Oz, let me, let me plug yeah. in the plug right here so you can zap. <laughs> nah, you can take care all of it. All right. Me. Uh, tonight we have two, uh, only two orders of business. Both of them are interviews. Uh, they're both interviews for the town administrator's position. And our first interview is with uh, uh, Jeff Cab- Jeffrey Cabots. Sorry, Cabots. Um, and Jeff, we've got about 30 canned questions, well thought out. And not canned. They are well thought out. And there are less than 30, but we can go a little long in the tooth sometimes. And then afterwards, uh, after our questioning, after the interview questions, we'll commiserate. You can ask us questions. We can talk about Sunderland. We can talk about the Red Sox. We can talk about whatever you want. Okay? But we have an interview directly thereafter, so we're going to keep it in a 60-minute window. Brilliant. Okay. So, uh, comments from the board? Nope, not at the moment. We, we've done this. We're both yes. gray and graying yeah. during the process. <laughs> okay. Uh, who wants to start with the first question? Jeffrey. Um, good evening. Um, please take your time and, and uh, answer fully and complete. And if you want to go back, don't, don't hesitate. And um, you take this opportunity to sell yourself. Please tell us why you're interested in this position. Sure. So the longer answer is I have always been interested in government work. Um, I I got my undergraduate degree in computer science and graduated in 2002 right after the internet bubble (laughs) burst. And it had really, you'll find that my timing as far as graduating from school is not ideal. That, that was the first thing, um, and so I, I was building websites and really feeling unfulfilled and so wanted to find a more fulfilling sort of career path and wound up working for a think tank, decided I wanted to get into uh, government and somebody said, well, you should go to law school because if you, at least that way, if you get into government and you decide you don't like it, you'll have a law degree to fall back on in, in a career. I thought that was a good idea. And I graduated law school in 2009 when there were no jobs for anybody, much less lawyers. Um, I was fortunate enough to to get a job for the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce as their government affairs director. It was the closest thing I could uh, find to to government work. And um, from there, wound up working uh, for Governor Deval Patrick uh, for two years in housing and economic development. and then with the transition in, in the governor's office, um, worked for Mass IT for a year, and then found my way back to Amherst, which is my hometown. Um, you know, I've always wanted to come back to the valley. And, you know, Sunderland in particular, I think that there are several things, you know, I, I've done my research and, and what I found about Sunderland is it, it seems to be a community that really cares about its neighbors and, and uh, residents and, and not just the public boards but each other and it seems like when there's a, a particular issue or initiative it, it's a, a positive thing. The people who support it come together and um, they're generally, is it, they, they consider how it impacts other people but um, you know, there isn't a whole lot of opposition unless there's, there's really a reason to have opposition for it. And, and I feel like that's a, that's a really great community. Um, and the other thing was sort of looking at the select board or board of selectmen and, and how you operate and how, um, you know, you are thoughtful. And certainly I think people come into any issue with preconceived notions or, or an idea of where they're going to come out. Um, but, you know, having looked at, at your decision making process, really, you know, the open mindedness and, and the willingness to say, I think I'm right, but, you know, I, I'm willing to be convinced otherwise. And I think that, you know, those two things, the, the feeling of community and open mindedness are sort of what really interested me in, in this position. Thank you, Jeffrey. Mm-hmm. 
I'm going to go, or are you... Uh... Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right. Um, I didn't give you the high sign. No, that's okay. <laughs> I, I, I just didn't want to, like, burst in there, you know, I wasn't sure. You probably would have picked the same question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm actually I'm going to go all the way towards the end of the list. I'm just going to shake it up a little bit tonight. Um, so grants and other outside funding are an important part of a town's vision and can greatly enhance opportunities for community growth. Discuss your experience with procuring grants and other outside sources of funding. And, and I might add that these days, too, it tends to be a, a larger and larger part, especially the way things have been structured you know, at the State House. They're becoming a larger part of our funding. So. Yep, absolutely. The approach is a little different than it used to be. Yeah, so I, I'll answer your question and then I'll expand a little bit if that's yeah, right. That's but right, sure. um, I think the two, two grants that I've uh, applied for, um, one just submitted um, the, for the Amherst Center Cultural District. Every year the Mass Cultural Council uh, offers, or so far has been offering about $5,000 uh, to cultural districts for cultural programming, um, advertising, events, that type of thing. Um, so just submitted that so I can't claim success, but hopefully uh, I would be able to in, in January or February. Um, and then about two years ago, uh, I was the lead staff member in Amherst Community Compact application um, okay. for a community compact community and in addition to, you know, obviously the extra points on MassWorks grants and other other grants, um, I think we applied for Complete Streets, uh, the and the Economic Development Plan, and we were awarded a twenty-five thousand dollar grant to um, start doing economic development. And with that, we contracted with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to do a SWOT analysis. Um, uh, uh, retail market analysis and uh, economic indicators report um, and then just the other thing is working in housing and economic development I sort of got a behind-the-scenes view of how at least the, the previous administration looked at grants and evaluated them and so um, having some understanding and the obviously the major grant there was um, mass works but also involved in the low low-income housing tax credit uh, program from DHCD. And, and so just seeing how, how they evaluated different grant applications, I feel like it gives me a, a different perspective on grant writing. Yep. Which I think okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Can I follow up, David, on, yep. that, on, that, on that question? Yep. On the DHCD work, were you with the agency? I don't so, have a DHCD bias, by the way. I just want to put that out there. I've complained about them, but they've also been very helpful. No, uh, so I, I was the deputy chief of staff for housing and economic development, which is the parent uh, office. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so it was more, they, they did the evaluation, and then we did sort of a, a higher level review of, of their decisions. Great. Thank you. Um, Citizens, uh, residents, various cultures, various backgrounds, what approaches have you used to ensure uh, adequate attention is given to the varying needs of, and I don't like the way the phrase, questions phrase these yeah. groups because they're all really residents, but approaches, we have a very diverse community. Yeah, I, th I think that certainly understanding the cultural differences um, and, and potential cultural barriers, whether they be language barriers or approaches to um, just to, to everyday interactions. You know, there, there are certain cultures where um, you go to buy something and they want you to haggle. It's, it, it's weird not, you know, if you just pay whatever the sticker price is. And so um, understanding that uh, cultural attitudes and, and differences are, are not reflective of who the person is, but more their upbringing and, and not taking any personal offense to that. Um, obviously, barriers such as language, um, I sadly only speak English, so I, <laughs> I would need to find outside help, but that's certainly something, you know, in Amherst we have a lot uh, and a growing number of Asian food restaurants run by um, people whose first language is not English. And so understanding 
in, in my role as economic development director, what their needs are as business owners and, and being able to communicate with them and engage with them is critically important. Um, and trying to use resources, uh, translation resources, or um, potentially student interns that, that can provide that kind. I think that's something that um, the Chamber of Commerce or the Business Improvement District uh, attempted to do at one point is um, have a student intern who spoke, I think it was Mandarin, go to the Asian food restaurants and just do a survey and say, hey, talk to us a little bit, let's collect some information. Um, but you know, that was one of the things, I think it was two or three years ago when the Gazette did the expose on the, the Asian food restaurants and how they were treating their workers. Yep. And part of it, what, at least part of what I understand the justification was, was yeah, we might be paying below minimum wage, but we're offering housing and culturally that's something that, you know, in our home countries, that's what we did and it was okay. And so, you know, wrapping my mind around whether or not that's okay in the US and not, but having that conversation saying, look, maybe that's culturally appropriate there, but when you come here, I mean, how you need to pay a minimum wage, that's what we have it for, and you can't necessarily get around it. But explaining that to them in a cultural difference type of way and not in an accusatory, you know, you're doing something wrong on purpose and, and intentionally hurting people. That's a good example, thanks very much. Jeffrey, what strategy, strategies do you use to anticipate problems? Please give an example. And if a problem arises that you have not anticipated, how are you likely to handle it? And also give an example. That's a great question. So I, I mentioned law school. Um, never never practiced as an attorney, but trained as one. Part of, part of the training is where are potential pitfalls? You know, what, what could go wrong? And so that is just how my mind works uh, through any particular issue is looking at um, ways things can go sideways and you know, not necessarily coming up with a detailed plan if it doesn't look like it's likely to go sideways, but saying, yeah, that there is the possibility that this could go wrong and here might be a way to, to cut that off ahead of time. So preparing for those types of things. Um, certainly, e even the best prepared, best laid plans go awry. And I think that when that happens, you know, first and foremost, uh, staying calm. Not not. It's usually a high pressure situation, and when things go wrong unexpectedly, tempers can flare. So I think maintaining. Uh, a calm presence and making sure other people stay calm is critically important. Um, bringing together the team, if it's, you know, assuming something goes wrong and it's fixable, who who is responsible? And sometimes nobody's responsible for the issue. Hey, we have an old sewer pipe, it burst, we need to solve it. Um, you know, you get the DPW on the phone, you have to talk to police or fire to close off the roads, potentially, you know, what is the team we need to get together, come up with a plan, communicate to stakeholders, we have a plan, um, and, and then execute it. And then the last thing would be to, to go back and say, is there something that we could have done before this turned into a problem to head it off? You know, for the sewer pipe example, hey, look at our infrastructure. Is it getting old? And do we need to do a better job of looking at our deferred maintenance and keeping up on that? Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, <clears throat> please describe how your previous work experience has prepared you for this position. You can, you know, if there's any particular thing that stands out or currently, you know, what's going on over in Amherst. Yeah. Especially because we're a little bit of a different town size-wise, but. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think that there are a number of experiences um, that, that have prepared me for this. In Amherst, I work directly for or with for the, the town manager and with the town manager and uh, with on a number of uh, initiatives, the assistant town manager. So I get to see um, sort of how they approach things, uh, how they prioritize big issues, how they prioritize their town, um, you know, uh, excuse me, they prioritize their time, not their town. <laughs> um, 
And so I think that that is certainly one um, working for state government, I think, has also prepared me in that, you know, working in Governor Patrick's office, I was deputy director of cabinet affairs, which meant, it, you know, I was responsible for um, coordination with the uh, secre education secretariat, um, the public safety and security secretariat, and um, I think the health and human services secretary. So broad range of issues uh, and not necessarily having a lot of in-depth knowledge and having to sort of uh, learn on the fly and do my best to trust but verify the experts in the field. Um, you know, I think that I'm never gonna, you know, be the, the most knowledgeable person about public works or um, about uh, public safety or, or um, education for that matter. But I think that having the right people in the room and trusting that they do know what's best um, and, and working with them to sort of set the overall vision and coordinate it and making sure that uh, your goals and your priorities are being carried out, I think is, uh, is something that, that my previous experience has prepared me for. So as I understand from your answer, you, if we run short of a snowplow driver, you'll not be available to drive a snowplow. <laughs> I am. I is that a class C license? I, don't know. I did work for the Amherst Department of Public Works, but in the tree division, uh, the water division, actually, in, right after high school. So I could I could cut trees. I could uh, <laughs> so, probably not run a water treatment plant, yeah. but uh, but know who to call. Yes. Could I follow up on, on Dave's yeah. question? You you uh, Jeffrey, if you could, um, you describe working at state level on the on the. Um, on a particular at a particular level you're working in i mean this is off script right now you're working in a municipality now at, at a very similar level right you have kind of big picture economic development etc but a, a smaller uh, more refined uh, focus i guess is is there is there a functional difference that you see between the two or is it just bigger more and then same problems smaller more focused you know, I, th I think the bigger difference is the proximity to the people you're affecting. Oh, that's a good point. Um, and, and that's part of the, you know, in, in law school, I interned for several members of Congress because, again, I, I did law school in Baltimore, partially because I wanted to be near D.C., and that was my um, goal was to work in Washington. And I realized I, I was doing these things that I was – you know, part of my job is answering the phones and talking to constituents and realizing that there was really a huge disconnect between the policies that we were working on and how it trickled down to, to the constituents. And that's part of the reason that I, you know, in the interim, I said, well, who do I really care about? I care about the people of Massachusetts. And that's why I came back and worked in state government. And then I said, well, this is still a little bit you know, attenuated from, from the people that I'm trying to help. And that's when I said, that, well, municipal government seems to make, you know, that's the closest to the people. That's really what affects day-to-day -day lives. And that, that's really what I was looking for, is how I can make an impact um, on people's lives in a positive way. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, so we talked about the last number of years. Uh, three professional goals for the next five to ten years. PhD from MIT in chemistry. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> on, a top, on top of the full-time yeah, job? On top of the yeah. full-time job, exactly. Okay. And raising a family. <laughs> um, I think that one, one is certainly to broaden my municipal experience um, and experience in government. I think that, you know, some of the things that I've worked on in Amherst, I didn't expect to work on when I took the job. And, um, 
you know, one example is local implementation of legalized cannabis and adult use cannabis. I, that was not on my radar. <laughs> um, another is uh, parking and, and paid parking and what that's like in Amherst. And um, so I think that as I gained more and differing experiences, I, I realized that, that uh, economic development is a, is a piece of the pie, but I really want to understand the full picture. And um, so I think that that's, that's one of my goals is to better understand, you know, what is the budgeting process and, and how do we develop uh, and fund or provide the resources necessary to, to achieve various goals from sustainability to transportation to economic development. And um, so I think that's one of the goals. I would say, Another goal, if I'm you know, fortunate enough to, to get the position as the town administrator for Sunderland, would be you're, you're entering or just barely into your fourth century as a municipality, and that, that's pretty exciting. Um, and what do you want that fourth century to look like? You know, I, I would love to be involved in, in shaping that vision and, and beginning to execute it, and I understand, you know, uh, that that the um, lifespan of a town manager or a town administrator is not <laughs> not particularly long. I think ten years would would probably be a really solid run. Um, but I think that a lot can be accomplished. You know, that's you'd be ten percent into that fourth century, and I think that that can really set a a, a solid path for for the rest of um, you know that that up to year four hundred when you have your would that be a Quad centennial. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that, that those would be uh, some of my goals over the next five to ten years. There are many of those uh, newly empty rooms on quiet nights where, you know, policy and consensus is developed and policy is conceived and direction is slowly, you know, yeah. nudged. The nose of the super tanker gets nudged and it goes to town meeting and it gets nudged. And ten years later, you look back and go, wow, we have a housing plan? Huh. Yeah, and th I mean, that's another thing. I, I was looking at the community development strategy document, and, um, you know, I think one of the things that I, I would love to do, I think it was updated maybe two years ago, but looking at it and saying that there are some things that you checked off, and, you know, does it make sense to revisit that? I know it typically it probably is a little bit sooner than you have in the past, but, um, you know, if there are things that have been checked off, what, what goes on now? What are the new things that, that should be part of that? And I think, by the way, that's a great document to help sort of guide somebody, whoever's in this position, of, of what the town's priorities are. And I think it's great that you have that. So. Thank you. Jeffrey, please consider the following situation, which may occur from time to time. Your elected board at a public, here, public meeting appears anxious and ready to vote on an important policy de decision that you firmly believe would be detrimental to the town. The issue had not been discussed previously and therefore is a new issue. What would you do and how would you do it? Well, I would certainly uh, hope that that would rarely happen and that we would have discussion, um, but I understand that those things come up and uh, I would um, I think that what I would try to understand is the need to move quickly and to vote that night and why it is, uh, whether or not it can be postponed to the following meeting um, so that there is time for discussion and I could potentially do uh, some research and, and come, uh, I assume the elected board would be you all, come to you and, and explain my position and why I disagree. Um, and ultimately, if you, if I'm not able to convince you that, that I'm right, you know, my job is, is to execute and you, and you vote and, uh, you know, I, I would present my best case, but, um, you are the elected officials and, and the, um, the, the body responsible for making those decisions. And, and so I would respect that, but, uh, you know, would hope that, that if it was not an emergency to vote that night, that there would be time to, to have a discussion um, and 
to, to better understand where you're coming from and potentially hear uh, why I might disagree. In fact, I think if you look in our policy and procedure someplace, it doesn't really allow us to vote. I was going to say, yeah. Well, not to say that we have to follow policy and procedure, but yeah. we are a bunch of hot suspend those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To Tom's point, that is one. If something does come in the day of the show, doesn't make the agenda. You know, so yeah. I don't think so, that's ever happened that I know. Of. Said before, unless it's yeah, unless it's a pay raise for us. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Why would I not support that? Uh, <laughs> uh, interesting. Thank you, Jeff. Um. So okay, we've reviewed your. Bleh. Try that again. It's been a word long salad. Bleh. 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 So we've looked at your resume and everything, but um. And, you know, so we can obviously see what's on paper there. But tell us a little bit more about your um, self, your professional and personal interests and things like that, just to give us a, a, a little fuller picture of, like, what do you do when you've checked out for the day and your wife has gone out with your son or something like that, or you know, so you have a little little time to yourself. Yeah. Uh, or with your family, you know. I mean, it, so I think with the family, one of the things we've really been enjoying um, is going hiking. I grew up as a ski racer, um, both at Berkshire East and in Vermont on the weekends. So getting my kids into skiing, the five-year-old is already skiing black diamonds. And <laughs> the, the you're, fear, you're fearless then. Yeah, exactly. yeah exactly. That's the time to get out and do it. Until he falls and breaks something. Yeah. Um, the, excited to get the two-year-old out there. Um, so I think, you know, a skiing outdoor activity um, that's another reason that I'm interested in Sunderland is is the boat launch and the river walk I think are going to be um, really exciting things and and even if I'm you know not the town administrator I'm hoping <laughs> that we're going to take advantage of it as nearby residents um, so I, I guess that's you know this time of year, Sunday afternoon, I'll probably be watching the Patriots game. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, uh, I, I like hockey. <laughs> Baseball's tough for me. Um, but you know, I, I think that I think friends and family, uh, and yeah, pretty much, you know, um, skiing and, and outdoor activities are sort of what what we like to do to unwind. Although I'd imagine that I'm entering that stage of parenthood where the kids are going to start driving <laughs> how my free time gets spent um, but you know I, I think that that's the you know growing up and, and my parent I grew up in Amherst my parents still live there we would take ski trips out west so that's always been you know being in the mountains whether it's in mm. summer or fall hiking or, or skiing in the winter is um, really what I enjoy doing and you know I, if it's been a long day vegging out in front of the TV <laughs> it just to unwind um, is, is certainly not unheard of in our household either yeah. okay thanks pivot back to the workplace uh, mm. can, you, can you provide an example of some creative problem solving from your past work history Something that came up or you know, anticipate, whatever, whatever it is, that's the question. Yeah, absolutely. So I think a good example of creative problem solving would probably be uh, the, the process that, that we developed in Amherst for making recommendations to the town manager whether or not to sign host community agreements for uh, retail mm -hmm. cannabis dispensaries. Um, and you know, originally we sort of proposed a slower, you know, the law said if, if you have medical, they, you can't stop them from converting. So the original proposal was very non-creative and it was, we'll just let those <laughs> convert and if they want to do uh, adult use sales and the select board at that time came back and said you can do a little better than that <laughs> we don't we don't want just because they were medical um, to allow them to, to sell adult use we want to really open up the marketplace and the town manager said why well, I'm not an expert in this um, so what we wound up doing is 
uh, you know, and, and I was in charge of developing this and then running the process was putting together a team and it was the, the health director, the police chief, the planning director, uh, myself, uh, and a select board member. And we would evaluate, it was sort of an RFP-like process where we asked them to submit a bunch of material. We'd look at it, uh, look at the location, make sure it was okay with zoning. Um, invite them to have a community outreach meeting and then actually meet with the team so we could talk about things that might be sensitive in a public meeting such as security requirements and um, really say hey this is your chance to impress us what's unique about you what, what are you going to bring to Amherst other than a business and tax dollars and um, how, how are you going to benefit the community and really sort of uh, push those groups to, to raise the level of their game and, and what they're offering. Um, and I think ultimately it was pretty successful. Um, in the first round, we recommended a host community agreement with one of the larger multi-state operators, which is open mm -hmm. down the street, Rise. Um, we signed a host community agreement with a fairly local um, Pioneer Valley operated company, Mass Alternative Care, that has their uh, facilities in Chicopee um, and are moving through the process of a retail establishment in Amherst. And then the third was a women, woman veteran minority owned business. Um, and so I think that we, we got a wide variety being unsure of how successful local small would be versus national and so um, figured we'd sort of run the gamut and I think that was a, a pretty successful model. Yeah. Jeffrey, describe how you would keep citizens well informed about government matters and conversely, how would you make sure citizens' views and concerns were properly addressed? Great questions. Um, I think that uh, to answer the first question, I think that there, there are two approaches depending on how large uh, the issue is. If there's something that's um, particularly expensive or a big policy issue, you know, my tendency would be to uh, try and advertise big meetings, get people together in a forum or a charrette to talk about what it is and, and get community input and ideally have more than one. Uh, one of the things that I've experienced is there's no perfect time of day <laughs> where everybody is available and it's convenient. Um, so I, I think on those big issues, on the day-to-day -day things, one of the things that I think has been really successful uh, in Amherst that the town manager has done is his Cup of Joes where once a month he uh, he is usually accompanied by a department head, but in the morning from you know seven to nine, he'll sit at a local coffee shop and just have sort of open office hours, not at town hall. Um, residents can come, and I think the the one twist I would put on that is, again, maybe mornings aren't convenient for everybody, so maybe it would be you know, have a, have a beer at the O's, <laughs> so just to mix it up a little bit, you know, different hours or something. Um, but try to have those open interactions and, and going out to the public, not necessarily um, always having them come here to, to talk to me. Um, and then as far as addressing citizen concerns, I think that it depends on whether or not it's it's something that I have control over and, and can solve. I think that if it's an easy fix or, or something that, that's certainly within within my ability to control and, and do something about in the short term, then you just do it if it makes sense, if it makes somebody's life easier. Um, if it's not, I, I think that it's important, if it's a, if something that can be fixed in the longer term, then you set out and you make a plan and you talk to them and you say, look, th these are the reasons why I can't do this today or tomorrow. Here's how we're going to get to a, a solution that, that's acceptable. Um, and then if it's something that just can't be solved <laughs> by, by me or I disagree with, with what they're asking for or, or their concern, you know, I want, um, I don't know, 116 to be 95 miles an hour. I think that's a safety concern. I'm not, you know, the, but have that conversation because I think that 
for any resident or citizen that comes to government to talk about a problem, it, it's because it's affecting their lives and it's important to them. So I think that, you know, at a minimum, making sure that, that they feel like I understand why they're coming to me and why and how it's affecting their life and what I can, if there's anything I can do um, more than just listening, um, having that open dialogue and saying, I, I understand that this is affecting your life, you know, it, it's making your commute three minutes longer by having to go, you know, 45 or 35, depending on where you are. Um, and I understand that that's tough for you, but this, these, are, you know, we can't have children get run over by going 95 miles an hour. And, and just having that conversation and hopefully getting to a place where they understand why it's something that I can't help them with. Thank you. Can I follow up, Tom? Yep. So on the, on the macro communications, how does how how do you feel uh, with with all due respect to our neighbors? How do you feel uh, communities in general and your current employer do communicating out big picture stuff to residents? We struggle with it all the time, and, and I think collectively we're in the same boat. I'm yeah, like, no, I, I it, it is a struggle, I, and I think that you know there's. It's a shared responsibility. Um, I think residents need to be engaged and, and be open to reading the local paper. You know, there, there are communication mediums, website, social media, um, Oz, yeah. you know, Oz. Ways, of, ways of getting the word out. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that, you know, every community wants to be as, as open and communicative as possible. Um, but it's also the resident's responsibility to to seek out that information and to find out. So um, I, I think no matter what municipality you go to or level of government, I mean, a state government, federal government, I think they all could do better at, at outreach. And I think that one of the interesting things that, that I learned um, is better interactions, and this might also go back to the question about cultural diversity and differences. Uh, there is a professor at UMass who is developing technologies to have better public meetings, and um, we actually used that at one of our parking, where we tried to pilot at one of our parking meetings, and you know it was just a clicker, and I think it was there would be three options, and throughout the meeting, if there's something that you agreed with. You know, you, did, you click A, and if you disagree, you click B, and if you didn't understand, you click C, and then they would record the meeting, and they would sync up the audio and have a transcription, and then you could see, you know, what was that? What were they talking about, and how many people in the room agreed with that particular point? Um, and the idea was there are some people either because they don't feel comfortable talking in crowds, or um, they don't feel comfortable speaking in English. Uh, actually saying that they agree with something, they, they'd be more comfortable to communicate uh, via clicker. So I think that being aware of new mediums to help engage people and, and communicate with them and, and make sure that they understand and, and gather that feedback is, is important. Um, but we, yeah, we can always do better. Yeah. Something that we, I, I, I speak for myself as a, as a member of the board, but communication is, you know, we try it from four or five different angles, four or five different approaches, and invariably there's still, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's so tough. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Describe an ethical dilemma you face in the workplace. How was it resolved? What was your role in the resolution? What, if anything, would you do differently if you were faced with the same issue again? Ethical dilemma. Um, that is a good question. So, so I. You took the town manager's parking spot. Yeah. <laughs> so, as I as I mentioned, I I have a degree in computer science and I built websites for a number of years, and um, my sincere hope is that somebody watches this at the state and and uh, fixes this problem. <laughs> So, <laughs> as I'm sure you're, you're familiar, um, there is an ethics, you know, training that, that um, uh, employees and officials have to take. And 
I discovered that the end of, at the end of it, it's a website and it's encoded in HTML. And so this certificate that you get at the end, you copy the HTML and you change the date and you just got your certificate for the next year, or the next year, or the next year. And I, mm. you know, I brought that to their attention. And uh, so the resolving it was I didn't actually do change it. I, t I keep taking the, the training. But, you know, it's... Uh, I think that it's it's fairly. Um, I, I won't speak for, for anyone. I'll speak for myself. I think that um, a lot of. Um, I find that the training, you know, after taking it several years, it's the same training. It's the same questions. It's a bit tedious, um, and so I think that you know it, it's an ethical dilemma. Is there really any value to taking this? Um, and if you find a a workaround is it really that bad? But the the fact of the matter is, I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> you know, you you do the training because it takes an hour or two of your time, and is that it's really not worth getting in trouble over. But um, that that was an interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> I appreciate that. I didn't mean to jump out of sequence. Thanks. Well, Thank you. Um, Wait, but you know, I'll sort of combine like six and seven because they're yeah. sort of like the, yeah, yeah. the yeah. opposite sides of a coin. So, describe like what were your two of your biggest work accomplishments and how were you able to obtain them? And then take the flip side of that, maybe a couple of the uh, failures, and then um, you know, what have you? What would you do to prevent those from happening again? All right. So, I'll cheat and I'll say one of I think one of the the biggest accomplishments was um, the the adult use cannabis implementation in Amherst, I think that that's, um, and, and you know, I maybe in five or 10 years, I'll say, no, I'm not proud of how that I went. But, you know, having no experience and, and nobody really to turn to elsewhere in Massachusetts to say, how did you do that? Um, because everybody was that, that was trying to implement, it was going through the same thing. Um, sort of making it from whole cloth was, you know, I, I'm pretty proud of, of how that went. Um, you know, another another thing that, that I was proud of um, working for housing and, uh, well, actually working in the governor's office was um, one of the last regulations that, that the governor approved of where we're, um, restraint and seclusion re regulations for schools and my father was this a special ed teacher and, and department head in Amherst for a number of years and so I understand that you know this certainly you don't there there are some students that have um, e either mental or behavioral issues and, and can't always control their body and become a danger to to employees or other students um, and so there's a balance and but there are also students that um, just are kind of <laughs> out of control and so you know having having that balance and it, so it's, it's not something that I work personally on developing the regulations but um, Again, it was from the education secretary. I, I saw how hard those people were working open, almost up to the last minute of the administration. I mean, this was one of the final things. Um, and I, the governor had left the office, and it was like the, like the last thing. And, and I remember um, calling his cell phone in the car as he was heading home and saying, Governor, you have to sign these. You have to sign these regulations. I mean, these, and again, it is not, not me personally. I thought it was it was really important to get it done for the safety of the students and, and for the safety of employees. And he said, "Are you sure that this is right? And that that uh, you know that the teachers union isn't <laughs> isn't going to come down on me and, and crush me for this? And you know, parents aren't going to do something." And and I said, "Governor, your people have been working really hard on this, and, and I, I believe in them, and I think that it's something that that." You know, will, will enhance your your legacy and, and is the right thing to do. And I just remember him saying, "You better be right." And you go, oh, God, "I hope I am." Um, but you know, that that was another thing that I was proud of. Um, 
failure. That's not pulling a punch there. <laughs> um, you know, I guess what I would say is, is one, one of my uh, regrets that wasn't a bigger success mm -hmm. was um, the, the iteration of the University Town of Amherst Collaborative, uh, which was a town gown collaboration. Um, I, it had just kicked off before I started in Amherst, and, and part of the job description was liaison to the university. And um, it was it was a bit of a struggle in that it was not well defined what that group was supposed to do, what authority they had, were they more of a discussion group, were they a think tank, were they supposed to uh, offer actual policy? You know, it wasn't a policy making body either on campus or in the community, so they couldn't they couldn't amend bylaws, they couldn't pass zoning, they couldn't. Um, you know, change how the university approached education or student behavior. Um, so, you know, it was really unclear what what we were doing, but there were a lot of people who were really passionate about it and really wanted to be involved um, and had really good ideas, you know, and so I think that ultimately there, there were some limited successes, so I won't call it a complete failure, but I think that the opportunity that we had to, to really strengthen the relationship between uh, the, I'll call them the full year residents off campus and, and, and people on campus, faculty, staff, and students um, was a missed opportunity. And I think one of the things that I learned from that is you really have to do two things if you're serious about uh, an initiative. And, and one is, you know, create the vision and say, here, here is really what we're looking for. Um, and not just say, we're going to sit around and talk about these three issues. It's, it's what, what are our goals? And, and you, we can figure out how to get there, but a specific, you know, um, measurable, achievable goals. And then the second is, if you're going to do something, do it right and put resources behind it and say, yes, we're supporting this and we're willing to put um, financial or uh, personnel support <coughs> behind actually accomplishing those goals. Um, so I good, think that, good that lessons that's... To learn. Pardon? Yeah. Good lessons to learn. Pardon? Yeah, good lessons to learn. Yeah, absolutely. They are. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's, I, I would say that if we... If you asked us, that's what I would say, is you, you have to define what you want to do and get it done. Yeah, yep. Very good. Yeah. I like that answer. Very good answer, Jeffrey. There's <laughs> so two here on the cube, but I think we've been around them. One happens to be education, the other one happens to be difficult yeah. problems. But I think it's been a, it's been a wide under, under successes and uh, um, opportunities. Uh, the eighth would, would be, would be well, ca well captured. Uh, I would also uh, say that this is the time you get to ask us questions. And God forbid, we, we all know that you know there's eight inches separates a noose from a halo. So you know, and don't don't expect greatness. <laughs> awesomeness. Awesomeness, though. Awesomeness. There you go. Um, great. So you know, I I guess one of the things. And, and this uh, sort of ties into to the the last statement is you know looking at the community community development strategy. Um, there were page and a half, two pages of number one priorities, and then some twos and threes. You know what 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 would you say are are your sort of top three things that you'd like to accomplish in the next three to five years, um, or you would like the town administrator to accomplish? Uh, my, my number one is to bring some our senior housing online. I, I, it's been um, 20 years in the making. It, it's over 20 years. Yeah. It, it started uh, probably 30 years ago in town and where the library is now, that was uh, Franklin uh, Housing Authority was going to put a uh, senior center there and it was just going to, that, that, there was a plan for that. 
and that was on our 275th anniversary yeah. celebration, <laughs> and there was a lot of uh, discussion around there, and and it fell through. Unfortunately, it fell through. Um, and now we've bought we've bought the property. We we've working with RDI. We've mm -hmm. we've gone through the zoning. We've gone through the conservation. We've gone through the DEP. We've gone through. Um, Negotiations and and I, I think we're back on 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 track, but to get that built, it, it's such it's such a need. It, and and I I I, I think it's um it it's good for the area because I mean I'm I'm involved with the senior center as our as our <clears throat> board rep over there, and I I think. When you listen to the seniors, they're 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 in the other communities. They're mm -hmm. very they they're using it as an example of what can what a t town can do. So that that'd be one of my biggest things is, is to make that happen. Yeah. Over the next hopefully it's going to be less than <clears throat> three years, but yeah. that'd be number one for me. Um, I think I probably like a couple of quick things come to mind. Um, like the first is we've got our North Main Street project mm -hmm. and talk about what's going to happen to the intersection of 47 and 116 and tying that together with what we're doing here on School Street tied to, and that's tied to like complete streets and, and some other grants and trying to shepherd that through because there's a lot of concern about um, how that's going to affect the I don't know, the, the atmosphere, but the feel of you know how how that those projects will affect how the design of it and how it um, the traffic and everything because that's got a big impact on the center of the town because it's kind of while it's along what they call a linear common, it's also kind of chopped up by 116 that right. you know was back in the 50s or whenever they built that, um, and then <clears throat> another thing is. Um, Trying to get some more, you talk about technology, I actually work in IT, so, um, and trying to sort of bring us a little forward more and using some more things like that, especially for outreach to, uh, to folks. And it's always a challenge. Um, social media, you have to, is something you really have to carefully manage. And especially when we don't have we don't have an IT department, right? Or, we do not. We, um, or a social media relations no, department. Yeah. We don't have any of those <laughs> so, departments. You know, trying to figure out how to manage all of that. And um, the the tools, you know, it's interesting that one the other night somebody was talking about using Facebook. Well, you know, you can't just make an assumption that Facebook is the way to go because that's widely it really depends on the demographics and the age of the people and things like that. And, you know, because you talk to some folks and it's Snapchat and TikTok, you know, so it all depends on who you're talking about. And with limited resources, we have to figure out what's going to work best for us. And, you know, and probably every five years or so, you know, there's a big sea change in which is the hot social media platform of the moment and everything. And I don't expect that to change. So trying to integrate that and then trying to, to make us more efficient here. I mean, we, we really strive for like procedural things and making things as efficient as we can. Um, and any kind of technology that we can incorporate to, uh, without a massive budget to help us would be good, you know. And, and I, I found that interesting, the, uh, the piece you were describing about the meeting and the clicker use and stuff like that. And I think, you know, integrating it and you know, working with the university more, I think it would be a, a good thing. And, and I mean, that's all tied to, you know, I think economic development and all of that is really important too, because we're um, a small community. We don't have a lot of industry or commercial property. So that's always a challenge here. You know, there's that constant tension of, well, we need more businesses, but we want to keep the way everything looks the same and everything. <laughs> And that's never a constant that. tension. No, <laughs> never, I bet. Ever, never. Never, <laughs> never. So that's, you know, that's always a challenge. I, I, would, I would piggyback on what Tom said about the senior housing, but I would, I would draw the next line under that. We have a housing production plan, the second, second version uh, that's been, second update approved by DHCD. 
uh, with our current uh, development at Sugarbush and the that's the rental units and the senior housing plan we'd be like just shy of 10 percent we have a housing production plan uh, in place and executing that plan finding partners to help execute that plan for our housing production units over the next decade is going to be helpful we're in the process of completing a resiliency plan with a with a FERCOG uh, natural hazard mitigation that's going to be an important thing to get wrapped up put a bow on it and, and take those steps I would also say that in the last three years we've developed a 10 to 30 year capital plan for our building assets and so you know calling out projects is easy but one one hidden element of that is to make sure that whatever projected debt schedule occurs uh, has a stable a stabilizing impact on the tax rate so you don't drop debt off that's exempt debt and you bring debt back on that's not exempt debt it'd be right. nice to remove to those peaks and canyons and just go okay we're retiring this and lining those two things up uh, can can line those two things up will take energy and focus uh, and then and then lastly uh, I would I would say an area for the next you know three to five years is, is clearly going to be uh, we are a dynamic uh, community. There's a fair amount of people who have been here a long time, and there's a lot more people who come and go. And in in that case, community can 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 be bifurcated, in my opinion. And that that is um, that's always a challenge. So, anyway, plus a balanced budget, <laughs> plus plus you know state stuff, yeah. plus plus plus. And just a quick follow: when you said just shy of ten percent, is that the subsidized housing index? Or yes, okay. yeah. yeah. We have a lot of apartments, but. Because they're not protected. Under, and you're also open to an unfriendly 40B. Project. We're open to fighting friendly, yes. unfriendly 40Bs. We like friendly 40Bs. <laughs> we have an unfriendly 40B, as you might categorize that. Correct. I, yeah, I know that's not the yes. it's, it's but, yep. well, well, no, <laughs> we'll see, but I, I don't, it's that, a tough that, explanation because yeah. we, we, we actually, in, 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 in our 300th parade, we, had, we were talking to, uh, the uh, board of selectmen at the time they had marched in the parade and said, "Well, you know, you guys shouldn't have you shouldn't have uh, you know fought that 40B." And it's like, well, they never gave us a chance. And and what do you mean? And and you know everything that we talked about 13 we talked about 13, 14, 15 years, and and from the very day that the the project first walked in, they said, "Well, the planning board wouldn't talk to them." You know, we had Dana Roscoe and, and at the time Russ Crenshaw, two, two of the nicest people that I know of. Um, and 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 I said, well, and I talked to him. I said, well, they said he wouldn't talk. He says, Tom, they came in, they wouldn't give us any plans. They just, they just, and, and we just asked them give us a plan to talk about what they want to do, but they won't put anything on paper. And you know, to this day, Jeffrey, that um, things that. And if you look at the traffic plan, the traffic plan says that they, they expected 65 cars to use yeah. that facility. 130 units, right? 150. Yes. 125, 150. 150. Okay. And, and but that but beyond that, now they're renting out not apartment, you know, one bedroom, two bedroom, but they're renting out bedrooms. So there's like 345 Occupants. bedrooms. And, and and it's like, and we said, well, the way you're designing it is it looks like it's going to be, to us, like it's going to be student housing. Oh, no, 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 no. Tom, these are young professionals. But, and if you look at their advertising today and how they're putting the bedrooms for, you know, for rent, they're, they're looking for students. And then there was a concern about water. Then there was a concern about sewer. And as they're going on, they're discussing those things with us now. So... There was never an opportunity to sit down and have a total discussion. And so, to, can I summarize? Is it correct to say that you would hope to get to the ten percent threshold so that you could have those conversations? It's not that you're opposed to the project, but you want to have the conversations. Right. That's a great answer. And concurrently, mm -hmm. while that development is being uh, had, we're using the friendly forty B format for the developing of senior housing with the full support of the town. Exactly. So, and, so and it's, it's, like, it's like so. And so which developer. one? Which one? You know, I have I have a really small high horse to get on on occasion, but I, I can do it. So when we went to the DHCD and said, so we've got fifty one percent of our 
uh, housing stock is in rentals and our first 40B project is a project that's going to increase our housing stock by 9.2% and it's rentals. How creative is that well, as opposed to first time home buyers or senior or owner occupied? How creative is that? I said, well, you don't have 10%. That was the answer. Yeah, and I get it. It's I, I completely numbers, yeah. get it. So yeah, are we? is there tension between friendly and not? Absolutely. It doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be, and 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 but basically we were push, put in a position where we couldn't have that discussion. Right. Yeah, I think what you said is and, really and the discussion, important. And, 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 and discussion was never held. Right. I mean, when when we we I mean I I went to a lot of the zoning board hearings mm -hmm. and the questions that came up in the zoning board that that the zoning board they were never they were never answered and they're still, they're and they're being developed as we as as right. as it's on on the on the on the fly. Right. I think they could have probably mm -hmm. had. And we said, well, you, you need to stop and look at our project in Belchertown. It's gorgeous. And, and it's like, well, okay, if you did that in Belchertown, but let's let's talk Talking about what project. you're what right. what you're trying to do. Right. And we never we never were able to have that conversation. And 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 any time we try to have that conversation, it it never happened. So, and it's a it's a powerful tool that can can really create good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely. So anyway. That's, we have a housing uh, production plan. That's that's another piece yeah. for that first set of years. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, how, how are we on time? I got two it, but Fire I can do quick. Um, the the quick question is just sort of looking at the fiscal year nineteen budget proposal. At least um, the the telecommunications committee budget. Yep. Um, I think went from a couple thousand to like 50 and I didn't get have time to dig in and I was just curious that huge sure. Oz. Yeah, so <laughs> it's Oz, right? It's all Oz. Yeah. So what, what happened was there's this accounting, accounting, we, we, Oz runs through the um, host license agreement. So Comcast money pays for Oz. So we account, we have, we had a working contract with FCAT that receipts would go flow through the town to fund Oz. The auditors came and said, you can't really fund Oz, even if it's a flow through with a license agreement with a contract with the other three towns with Oz, because town meeting never appropriated it. And so we always had an appropriation of blank, sub five digits. <laughs> But we had monies, a revenue stream, side revenue stream that was counted for on the on the on the revenue sheet. But last year had to go to town meeting as that as that article. Got so it. that's so that's, that's why our game. No, no big cost, but you look at it and go, whoa! You went from five to fifty. What happened? Right. Accounting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then my last question, if we have time, and if yep. we don't, please. Uh, just you know. What are some of the key qualities that, that, that you all are looking for in a, in a town administrator? Um, and, and what do you think, you know, I think that, um, and, and feel free to use previous town administrators' ex examples and say that person was great at that and we loved it and the, the perfect town administrator would have these three qualities or five and just. Good question, you wanna take the first crack? Okay, um, I, I I would think that in in the town administrator, uh, we as a board um, are very aware that um, a lot of the best of the, the way to get projects done is that it has to come from from our residents. Um, if you look at and you mentioned earlier the river the river walk, it's it's a perfect example. River Walk started by a group of, of residents that were um, involved with what we call a community pathway, and and then what what the uh, the community pathway group um, worked with the FERCOG and town administrator to get uh, um, compact money, community compact monies, um, and they had they had the vision of of having the um, a park. And, and not only that, but the walk alongside the river. So the town administrator was, was gainfully, the previous town administrator was get very gainfully um, involved with, with that group. Um, and, and we supported it um, and by 
and I think that was is the greatest thing. The town administrator ha has to um, work. And our next town administrator needs to work with our with our residents, with our committees, um, and and offer them and kind of be a jack of all trades that that is able to find um, those those ideas that are coming from the committees and and to develop them to to bring them to fruition and and that's sometimes not an easy thing to do um, but but you you get you end up with good, the, the veterans the veterans memorial that we have out here was this, was was the same thing and and you know there was a there was a group that 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 wanted a um, an obelisk um, and then and then mm -hmm. we had residents that said, "Well, maybe we can do something different." We ended up holding a uh, uh, jury selection. Uh, a, a jury selection mm -hmm. that we had. I mean, I think we had what 60, 60 designs that were originally submitted on paper, mm -hmm. and then then they then the town residents chose ten, and those ten uh, went to the modeling stage, and and then I mean it was, but it, it and, and and were commended for. The 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 um, for the veterans memorial, the product, right? but it was really it was really our residents that made made it happen. I mean, we had the thing set up in Fellowship Hall. We had designs. People are coming in here and they're voting, and but but it was it was about allowing the, the residents to do it. Selectman Selectman can lead. Um, and and some and and sometimes we have to say stupid stuff to make to make people get all up in arms and 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 just and, and you can look at the the blue heron blue heron why we have the blue heron today is because we the board of selectmen at one point had we had a committee that was supposed to do something and finally the board of selectmen said look you have six months or we're going to tear it down it was unpopular um but that group and look what we have. We have one of the finest restaurants in Massachusetts, and in, in our and we could bring people from all over the country. That it, there's weddings there on a on a weekly occurrence. People, you look at the parking lot over there. It, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, from all over the place. To, so. to follow up on that, the feedback a board or a town administrator gets is, you know, you guys or gals did that, right? Mm -hmm. So we had probably. Twenty-three to twenty-eight thousand dollars a year as an appropriation, just to keep that building from being taken back by nature, right? Because that's what no was nobody using it. Keep it heated, do basic repairs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The year that it pivoted, of course, it's not on the tax rate. The year that it pivoted, a very a very modest tip to uh, the Blue Heron for less less than ten years and less than the ten percent. Uh, wound that down. The very first year, it pivoted. It pivoted to, you know, a, a straight property tax input of in the mid 40s, and then personal property on top of that because all the kitchen equipment. So the delta was, you know, a cost of blank and uh, versus a plus up. A decade passes, and the resident says, "You guys sold that for a dollar." <laughs> but again, that's 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 the kind of yeah. that's the noose to the halo. That whole eight-inch spread I was referring to earlier, right? That's just the way it is. And I would say just real quick, two things: shepherding and listening. Mm. I was going to pivot on to listening as well. Listening, responding with empathy, maintaining people's self-esteem, asking for help, encouraging involvement, and then just recognizing. And if you and if you ask the town administrators that we've had in the past, none of them had all all of those right. individually right. had had all of that. Right. They came close. Some and and each one each one in my opinion, each one left their mark on their town. Yep. Each one were thankful that was spent their time in this town, and they did great. They did they, they, they did great things. But they all didn't. I mean, we had one that was a financial. She loved the finances. We had one that was a people person, and and we had and we had um, our, our one of our first town administrators. He was just a steady hand that we need. You know, made sure that we made sure that we had the uh, the assessors were doing their job right and making. And it, he was a, a bureaucrat. That's a good word, not a bad word. Yeah.
Great, but he was, he was described at one point by town council as he doesn't just know where, you know, who's under the rocks, he knows where the rocks are. <laughs> you know, like he was just that, you know, oh, okay. But, but, he, but each has put us in a better position. Correct. And, 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 and they, laid the, they laid the ground, each one laid the groundwork for the next person that goes there. And make it a little bit easier or tougher. Yeah. And I, I'm going to take just one second of advantage to what you started with, um, which was feel free to go back. Um, when you mentioned FERCOG, I think that, that was one of the questions was from my past experience, what could I bring to this? And I think that it, the relationships that I've built um, you know, over the past four years in Amherst with UMass PV, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, um, the Franklin Regional Council of Governments, the you know um, Mass Municipal Association. I think that I, I would bring all of those strong relationships, you know, to the position here as well. And I think that that's um, something that I should have mentioned earlier. And hopefully, I didn't want to pass up the opportunity to mention. It. So. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Appreciate Great. your time. It's been a nice conversation. I appreciate. Yes. Thank appreciate you very much for inviting me in. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Good day. Yeah. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. What do you think, Sarah? How are you? Good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. So a couple of items. I'm just Hi. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Tom and David. Uh, a couple of items. We are in open session, as you know. Yes. Absolutely. And uh, we are also uh, being filmed and being broadcast by. Oz back there, uh, or FCAT. So for the four communities, not going to be able to live that one down now. Uh, so this is the four community community access television. Okay. So if you want to watch it tomorrow on YouTube, you can do that. Okay. So our process, our process, our process was of course applicate broad was to um, um, send out notice to accept applications to have our personnel committee uh, screen those applications for qualifications and then uh, send to us. We didn't use a screening committee on this particular uh, town administrator search, um, only in that we've done it a couple of times and we're doing our level best to stay out of trouble. So we thought it'd expedite the process. Okay. Okay, so we've got about 15 questions and another extra 15 minutes of random conversation for the sake of it, it seems. I used to say 130 questions. People are like, what? You already told me you're on TV, plus 130 questions. Anyway, don't worry. It's, it's all going to be good. Um, so we've gone over your resume. And uh, let us let me know if you could. And I'll take the first one here. How has your previous work experience prepared you for uh, this position? OK. Uh, so I come from both a planning background and a, a public administration background with my uh, MPA from Westfield State. Mm -hmm. uh, I've gone on to further that education with um, courses from the Mass Municipal Association and Suffolk University. And although planning may seem like it's a little bit different from town administration, it isn't really. It's very tied, especially in a smaller community that doesn't have a designated town planner. Um, you know, I've, I've dealt with projects, I've dealt with state agencies and other communities and local governments and lots of different types of people. Um, so it, I think the, the planning background, rather than being a detriment, is really a strong suit. Good evening, Sarah. Hi. My name's Tom. Um, please tell us why you're interested in this position. Uh, I, as you can see from my resume, I live in Charlemont, so I am uh, a Franklin County resident. Um, I really enjoy my work in Northampton, but I've always been interested in, in small towns and small town administration in particular. Um, and this just seemed like a, a great opportunity in a, a really wonderful town that I've had lots of experience with in the past. Thank you very much. Um, what, what are your three main professional goals for the next five to ten years? Um, I'd like to see as many projects through to completion as possible. I started out with the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission in my career, which, although it was a really great experience and um, helped me to meet a lot of people and, and deal with small towns in particular, it, you'd sort of go in in a whirlwind, you'd help with a grant application, or you'd, uh, you'd get from point A to point B, but never get to Z. Uh, so that's something I've really enjoyed in Northampton. Um, and identifying those projects, finding the funding, um, and seeing them through to completion is something that's really important to me, so that would be one. Um, just um, meeting as many people as, as possible in a, in a new town and, and getting things done and 
I guess just, just branching out and getting to do some things that I haven't really gotten to do in the past. Good. Hmm. Thank you. Well, we certainly have a community that has no problem bringing themselves to the office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's a that's good thing. <laughs> and, and usually with uh, great respect. Uh, uh, as, as residents go, um, I'll say this because we're on TV and they all hear me anyway. Um, you know, we're we're uh, we're a town we're a town full of real pros. They're just it's good people. Okay, let's go right to failures. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Big failures at work. Uh, Why they occur? What what would you have done to prevent them from occurring? What have you done to prevent them from reoccurring? Excuse me. It's my favorite question. Okay. Uh, so I, without naming the, the no. specific yeah. with, with project, the um, I think the, the biggest failure that I've had is, is to have be presented with a, a great idea, delve deep into this idea for a long time, really get to know it, and then try and implement it without having gained community input in the interim. So, you know, I know about it. I've been dealing with it for months and right. months, but I, I forgot to... Uh, inform the community about it and, mm -hmm. and get their opinion. So it's sort of like you're, you're blindsiding them with something that, yep. although it's, it seems like, like a no-brainer to you, that of course we should be doing this and this is a great idea, I didn't tell you all, all of you all of those things. Yeah. So it's, it's really important to do that. It's that proximity paradox. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. So the lesson there is get, get the next question, involved. right? Yes. Communicate, communicate, <laughs> communicate. <laughs> Um, Sarah, what are your three main professional goals for the next five years and, or ten years? We did that one. Yeah. 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 I can give you more. <laughs> um, what are your biggest work-related re accomplishments and what were you able to attain them? Uh, I think my, my biggest accomplishments have been thing, accomplishing projects that weren't necessarily in my wheelhouse to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, the, the nature of planning is such that you get to be involved in a lot of different things like well you know, planning isn't just zoning and, and regulations it's you know it's restoring cemetery stones it's mm -hmm. um, protecting conservation areas it's building trails it's all sorts of different things so something that you maybe you didn't expect to, to do at the beginning of the year at, at the end of the year be, ends up being your biggest accomplishment Um, what strategies do you use to anticipate problems? Provide an example, and if a problem arises that you haven't anticipated, how would you likely handle it? I mean, it depends on the, the nature of the problem. If it's something that, that's sort of you, um, unique to the, to, the, to the office and will stay within town hall, then that, that's, you can deal with that in a different way. If it's something more public, then you have to use a, a little bit of a different strategy for that. So, you know, if... Um, if a, if a truck breaks down or if a, a building is starting to become in more and more disrepair, then you can, you can deal with that through comprehensive planning. Um, but other sort of unknown issues that, that arise from the community um, need a lot of public input. Thank you. Uh, so we talked about projects at Fairmont. Can you describe experience working with citizens from a variety of cultural backgrounds and approaches you use to ensure adequate attention uh, given to uh, all of the needs of uh, both these groups and your projects? Sure. Um, I, mean, I think that's the, doing that effectively is something that, that doesn't come naturally to anyone, regardless of their background. So just keeping, um, keeping that in mind at all times is tremendously important and to realize that you're not the expert like I'm I might not be able to reach out to the student community on my own but <laughs> speaking to someone who would know how to do that is really important yeah. or, or the elderly or um, people of different backgrounds so just just to know that that's something you need to do and engage different people to help you do that so it's like a, a state of mind essentially when I say that you know knowing that resources to assets to problems yeah like if I if I need to reach out to uh, non-english speakers where mm -hmm. do I go for that um, 
you know, don't just have a meeting at town hall and expect that you're going to have all of your problems answered because that's a really limited subset of the population who wind up showing up to those. Yeah, we know. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yep, great point. Yeah, my, most most community meetings, unless it's a really divisive issue, I do occur in, in empty rooms, unfortunately. So it's the on the it's the onus is on the the town um, to go out and solicit additional people. We've commented more than once about how, you know, working groups, not necessarily even elected officials, working groups, emergency preparedness groups, you know, hazard mitigation groups, you know, those, those meetings are binders and tables, and mm -hmm. you, you've been in those rooms, binders and tables, and it's like decisions are made and policies are adopted. It's empty space. And, and the, the less sexy the project, the harder it is to get yeah. people involved. Yeah. Like a yeah. hazard yeah. mitigation plan, nobody wants to go talk about that. But well, then well, when an emergency occurs, right. then well, why didn't I know well, about wait, this? Right. So yeah. It's, it's really good. important to find innovative ways to get people involved. Sarah, consider the following situation, which may occur from time to time. Your elected board at a public meeting appears anxious and ready to vote on an important policy decision that you firmly believe would be detrimental to the town. The issue had not been discussed previously and therefore is a new issue. What would you do and how would you do it? Uh, so if it's something that the board hadn't had time to consider that just came up at the meeting, I would definitely advise them to step back and do additional research. Um, I would be happy to provide them with that information, uh, but you know, not to jump to any conclusions or, or act hastily unless it's really absolutely warranted, like an emergency situation. Thank you. Um. Grants and other outside funding are an important part of a town's vision and can greatly enhance opportunities for community growth. Um, discuss how you did, your experience with procuring grants and other outside sources of funding and how, um, how you think they help shape the town. Uh, I've, I have a lot of experience with both with state and federal grants, uh, and I also administer the Community Preservation Act in Northampton, which I know Sunderland has as well. Um, but identifying funding sources to implement the projects that are important to the town is is critical, um, and then administering those grants once you're able to obtain them is um, a, a really necessary follow-up to that. But it, you can see from my resume that I've, I've dealt extensively with lots of different types of grants. Okay, thank you. So I, I like to com I used, like to use the old square peg in a, in a round hole analogy, right. like we well, have to shave the edges off of your project peg to make it fit in, in this yeah, hole. Pop right inside there. Yep. So could I go uh, piggyback off that question? Mm -hmm. How has CPA affected Northampton in a positive way? Oh, tremendously beneficial to Northampton. It was a shameless plug. I'm yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so Northampton, I think, is up to 120 CPA projects that um, I think 95% of them just wouldn't able to have been implemented in any way without Community Preservation Act yeah. funds. So it's critical. That's great. Very important. Uh, this is my ethical dilemma question. Describe an ethical dilemma you face in the workplace. How is it resolved within, within the confines, within the four corners of the article, if you will? Um, how is it resolved and what was your role in resolution? And uh, if anything, would you do differently? I think happily I have not really been involved in a, the in best a, in a personal ethical <laughs> dilemma. Yeah. Um, you know, I, as you've done, we take the, the ethics quiz. We, we watch the, uh, the video with the um, with all of the, the hints and tips and I, I've seen other people have sort of ethical issues that maybe I, I would have approached in a different way but I think not getting into those situations in the first place is important. Great point, thank you. Sir, describe how you would keep citizens well informed about governmental matters and conversely how would you make your citizens uh, make sure citizens' view and concerns were properly addressed? Uh, I would have to do some investigation as to what works best for people. Um, you know, is it, is it social media? Is it flyers? Is it mailings? Um, and and then go on from there. I mean, certainly posted public meetings are are just a start. But, um, using that as a springing board to see what else would be needed. Social media is probably critical. In, in this, this well, day and when, age, just in, in your planning, in your planning life, mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting that you go different parts of the country. 
some some parts of the country, if they're going to re have a rezoning or, or they'll have a big billboard um, and said, hey, there's going to be a town. We don't do that around here. Um, I mean, have you found better ways to notify people? Uh, we do use public notice signs. Um, so it's like a, a yellow legal notice that you put in the ground. Um, so not quite a billboard, but a little more than a legal ad, that, which can be helpful. Um, I think sometimes people will at least read them and then determine that they're not interested rather than not having seen the notice and mm. figuring that they, they're not interested that way. Um, and, but I think social media is, is really important to get things out there, although that can pre present some ethical dilemmas on its own, you know, with, with quorums and conflicts of interest. Yeah. And, yeah, we, we've had some we've had some zoning issues uh, in in particular zoning that you know people own the land but they may not live in the town and they they don't understand why they they don't know about it you know and and that's always been it, it's always been a tough thing to try to make sure people everybody gets informed yeah and that that's something that I think is a constant around the country for all types of issues you know, local state federal mm -hmm. um, the best that you can hope to do is get the word out there as, as much as you possibly can. Um, I used to do a lot of press releases, but um, unfortunately our, our press is getting a little a little more stressed and there's there's less people to deal with things. Um, but maybe even just a little mini ads sure. in the recorder, it's a cheap way to, yeah. to get the people who are reading the paper, uh, for people who don't read the paper, again, the social media and, and the town website. You mentioned the press that wasn't within Tom's or even my tenure, not one or two reporters from the printed media, and now very few, but they watch FCAT. They, they mm -hmm. draw it down from those, those other places, and then the phone will ring. It's like, hey, I missed the meeting, but, and it's off to the races. It's just, it's a fascinating change. Yeah, I mean, even to have the, the meetings televised and available mm -hmm. on the internet is a big step. Even if someone is finding out uh, about something after it's happened, right. at, at least they are informed and they can watch and see what might be coming down the pike. Oh, I think I, I I think the we were very early on had had our televised meeting, and and people sometimes are uncomfortable at at the meeting the first time, and but for for me at least it's like, um, someone says, well you 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 said whatever, and I says I never said that, and I go yes you did. I said no, you just go to YouTube and. Look up FCAT, right, and, and that was reasonable. not that wasn't said at our meeting, right. and that's not what I said. Right. So actually, I I I I like that we have FCAT and tape meetings. I think that it 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 does bring it does bring our government, the local government, to the people. And if they and if they actually take the time to watch or understand, they'll find out that they they know where every tax dollar pretty much goes because. Mm -hmm. We discussed in our budget system. We probably discuss all eight million four hundred fifty thousand dollars of it. So and fifty nine cents. Times. And fifty nine <laughs> cents. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard people say when when they're going to be speaking at a meeting that that's um, on television or maybe this this meeting of this board will be televised and it isn't usually like well, then I can't say what I want to say. Like, well, that's not how it works. Right. Like, you you need to be always keep that in mind that you, oh, know, I agree. you shouldn't you shouldn't be saying things that that you don't want out there. Like, personally, I always try to remember that. You know, anything I say or anything I write down could potentially be in the newspaper, and would I be okay with that? And if yeah. I'm not, I, I won't say it. Right, that's a really good point. And there are those, there are those. Yeah, you're absolutely right about. Hey, I can't say what I want to say. Well, I actually really can. It's, it's, you know, it's not that hard to put these behind you and simply go about the brainstorming session mm -hmm. or, or the uh, talking with enthusiasm, as Mr. Sokolowski said one year, one meeting. I wasn't yelling. I was talking with enthusiasm. Not on this side of the <laughs> Not river. Not on this side of the river. Sorry. Not on this side of the river. Paul. With a little trip down memory lane there, but <laughs> it was all good. Um, can you give an example of creative problem solving? You got a planner's background, so how creative can you get? Forget that square peg in the round hole as you described earlier. And especially with funding, you know, how can this is our project? All right. How can we get this done? Let's let's look at state programs that are out there. Let's look at private grants. Let's look at what we actually have for town resources that may, resources that maybe we haven't thought about. Um, just think of every way that you could possibly do something and see what's actually feasible. And don't throw out a possible solution just because it on at the first onset it, it doesn't sound like you could do it. Sometimes you can. Good point. Uh, 
let's see. Um, what are two of the most difficult problems you've encountered in your previous positions, and how did you solve them? Um, and I probably issues with um, that are, have been really controversial, and that no matter which decision you come to, people aren't going to be happy. Someone's going to be really, really upset about it, um, and that's especially true for things that are really emotional and close to people's hearts. Um, uh, but it, you know, sometimes you have to let people say what, what needs to be said, and sort of let them talk it out at a, at a public meeting. As difficult as that may be. Thank you. Okay, we've been through your resume. You've seen part of our interview process. You're involved in part of our interview process. Um, Brief in your qualifications. Tell us a little bit more about your professional background. Not maybe out of here that wasn't quite captured, or uh, any interests that could uh, be as part of the pro be as sure. part of the job. Um, I like to be outdoors a lot, um, so I I was excited about your your trail uh, and the the river access. That that's really great. I've dragged a kayak down that nice. that steep yeah. incline more than once. Um, it, it's well, the down better. isn't so hard yeah. to hop. Is the, the part. Did, you start, did you start in Shelburne and come down the Deerfield? Yeah, <laughs> yes, I have done that. Um, I think it, it's hard to convey in a resume how you approach your day-to-day -day work. Um, and it, you know, it, the, I always think the, the best job is one where I don't know what's going to happen today. You know, I have here's what I like to do, would like to get done. Uh, here are the things I need to get done. But who knows? Who knows what what issue is going to present itself? Um, who knows what I'll be asked to research or implement that I hadn't thought about last week, and, and that's okay. I really like that challenge. I find that exciting, and I, I just really like municipal work. Thanks so much. So we got one more, but we covered that area already, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. And, and it has to do with your educational background, but We've been through that through this series of, a series of questionings. We had the same. That, that's one in there that we kind of pass over often throughout the discussions, um, because frankly we have we have great applicants, yourself included, obviously. Um, with respect to just one comment about your last answer, um, the, the day to day in the municipal environment is an unpredictable random. You know, it's just it Absolutely. just is, and it's just like oh. Um, I'd like to follow if I could. I see a lot in planning, and I see uh, planning and sustainability, uh, planning administrator. Can you? Can you? This is off script right now. Can you talk a little bit about your experience in uh, uh, budgeting, municipal budgeting? I have budget ex experience with the Community Preservation Act and with specific projects. Yep. Um, oh. I deal. You you can do the CPA budgeting. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> hired, hired, <laughs> check. Well, I, right. I try. I mean, just today, I was, you know, I've been waiting and waiting for to see what our um, what our matches will be. Yeah, yeah. And nobody knows. Like, right. so how are we supposed to do anything if we don't know what the matches will be? But that, you, that's also kind of the nature of municipal work. Sometimes sure. you you're waiting for the the state to tell you something, and they're waiting on the feds to tell them something, and it, that's the challenge you need to work. And you have to put so much aside, and you have to. Yes. Yeah. And oh yeah, and and we have we have uh, one of our community members on the CPA Jennifer. She, I swear, she spends her entire life just trying to figure that out. And 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 then she'll say, and she does it with total chill too. Oh, she never gets excited. It's, like, yeah. it's amazing. But, but but then but then she'll have to have a meeting with Brian, right? The accountant, got it. and and his numbers won't match her numbers and. And then it's like usually like the day of the town meeting, we're changing numbers because the states changed something on us. And oh yeah, I it's an amazing process. The CPA, it's a great pro it's a great program. Right. But I think that that budget's one of the most. <laughs> it, it presents some challenges. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing. Uh, I I will in, I'll admit that I do not have experience with a comprehensive um, mm -hmm. municipal budget. Sure. Um, 
but that that's something that I, I would communicate with other town departments on. Right. Um, it's just you know it's a grant, but a much bigger scale right, with, right. with a lot more line items on it. Well, we've got I think if I if I could, we have a pretty strong. Um, platform the infamous spreadsheet the inputs and outputs have been developed and and pretty much adhered to so we try not to reinvent the wheel every year and those categories are really really important to kind of stay inside of now there are there are those you know unpredictable randoms that roll in any given year of particular expense but that's that's uh, it's all we, we take a, a pretty strong revenue driven budget perspective so we try to do it well it takes forever it, it gets voted on in one night. <laughs> it's like it's like I'm exhausting. Sure it it gets it's exhausting, but it's okay. We we managed to do okay with it. <laughs> okay, this is a chance where you get to ask us a handful of things, or exactly nothing if you want. It's up to, entirely up to you. Now we turn it over to you. <laughs> um, what do you, what do you like most about Sunderland, and what do you think the the biggest challenge for the community is in the next ten twenty years? Tom, you're the longest running here. Born and raised. <laughs> <laughs> he, likes, he likes something um, about it. Well, yeah. I, I wanted to live on the west coast of Panama, but Noriega was in charge. That's not going to work. And that, that wasn't yeah. going to work. Um, I, I don't know. I, for, for me, I, I like the, uh, the proximity. You know, in, in two hours, I can be in Boston, or two and a half hours, I can be in some of the wildest wilderness. Mm -hmm. um, in that we can there. find yeah. in, in the country when it, you go to the presidential range uh, three and a half hours you're or two, three hours you're in Connecticut um, I, I, I'm in New York City um, I love the uh, I love working with the people around here um, I, I, I think they're you can have brutally honest conversations with people, um, and and that's that's rare. Uh, there's not a lot of faults. There's not a lot of false faces. Um, and I think that's and and typically um, we do we do our town does our best things under under. Um, duress such as when we had when we had the October snowstorm um, we are one of the we we instituted uh, our, our our SEP plan uh, Sunderland Emergency Preparedness Plan and we visited every our elected people with our volunteers we visited every home every dwelling in town during that to make sure people were okay at one point in that, there was a 100% blackout. Just well, for, done. For a way. long time. Wiped out. For over five, it was like seven days before. But we, you know, and I don't, a lot of, lot of other places would not. Um, I like how we work with our surround. I, I like that we have a regional school system. Mm -hmm. I think our education um, is out, our, our opportunities for education in this area are, are, are outstanding between our secondary education, primary education, uh, UMass, Amherst College, GCC. Um, we, um, we have so many students in the area. We have a vibrant community. It's always, it's always changing. Um, on the UMass campus, you could find a, a play or um, professors giving or doctorate students or masters people with master's degree giving dissertations that you can go to and so there's there's education is a a great thing in this community so in this area as well bless um <clears throat> for me i you, know, you kind of hit a lot of the the points here but when i moved out here um a lot of the just the physical characteristics of the town, the location, everything, I think can't be beat. But one of the special things for me too was was the sense of community in the town. And um, a lot of the stuff in the town gets done by volunteer efforts because we're not a large town. We don't have 
huge budgets or departments. So a lot of the stuff that gets done is done by people pitching in, and I think there's a very strong sense of, of community, um, despite the fact that over the time that I've lived here, it's actually changed a little bit mm -hmm. too. Um, but the, there's sort of been that core of, um, of community there that's been great. I could go on and on, but <laughs> there's... Yeah. So when we were looking for a home. My wife had two, <clears throat> two requisites. One, I wanted to be able to walk. Hmm? Jan wanted to be able to walk to the school and walk to a store. Oh, yeah. Oh. It was easy, right? There Pretty straightforward. So that said, that's part of the model. I would say that uh, one of the attractions for me over my tenure, uh, both as a president as a, a participant in, in uh, p elected public service uh, and appointed public service, has been the, the, the continuity of um, the respect, even when we disagree. And um, the town has a, has a healthy trajectory. I think that's an important to bear in mind over the decades and the decades that I participated in town meeting, you know, there's been APR land that's been set aside. There's been development that's been modeled that, you know, uh, and to scale with the exception of a, a, a big 40B, but that's, that is what it is. There's been uh, creative thought as well as uh, thoughtful long looks toward zoning and planning. Um, you know, there's, there's reasons for those kinds of things. You miss it when you, you live the movie by one frame at a time. But if you, if you take the movie back 20 years and you spin it and go, oh, oh, wow, we really did get a lot done collectively as a, as a community. Um, and I think, you know, generally speaking, we work well with our uh, uh, neighboring communities. Every now and then they need to be bossed around a little bit, so bear that in mind. Uh, and the cog, is, the cog is fine, too. They do, they do great work for us and by us. And they're also on a learning curve as well. I hope they watch, but you know, we're not, we weren't always, I personally was not always a fan, uh, but you know, through uh, collaboration and work, we've grown to trust each other on things that are important. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, my affinity for Sunderland 101. So what else? Okay. And biggest challenges facing the challenges. Team? Uh, there's an inherent tension between uh, available revenue streams, maintaining open space, uh, challenge with uh, the percentage-based increases in budgets, in particular in education, when you have something that is, and I'm not, f I'm the farthest from anti-education, when 70% of your budget roughly is driven by one, to one category and it grows by 2%, every other category can't keep up. It just doesn't happen that way. So there's, there's always a her an inherent... Um, there's an inherent tension uh, with that. I think another challenge we've seen, at least in, in my, in, in again, maybe all of our tenures, traffic has become an issue. Like, not just yep. cars in general, but like people blowing, blowing through town like, like fast. We do some, uh, I'll use an example of Falls Road. When you get an 85th percentile of, you know, 62 miles an hour on, on a 25 posting, it's like, really? <laughs> Whoa. So, you know, people generally, given the opportunity, will do the absolute stupidest thing. So we have, a, we have some challenges in that area. Uh, edu education, the, the expense of education, um, And when you look at, if you go back over the numbers over the years, right. you'll, you'll find out that, that the, the residents of Sunderland, Deerfield, Whiteley, Conway, Shelburne, mm -hmm. Burnson, Montague, we've been upholding our commitment to education. Um, the state's fallen down. Mm -hmm. and, 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 some, and somehow it's, it's to convey... Convey... Con it is to convey that if 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 the the state the state has to take a, a more of a leadership role with education, especially the funding of education in in more rural areas, and 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 they have to understand that one one size doesn't fit all, and they don't they they have no idea what busing. You know what? What we pay in regional transportation. We're supposed to get back 100% regional transportation. We're, we're not even close. One one year went down to what 28%. Right. right. They have no idea, and and they don't they don't understand what these big things that are painted yellow with red lights are. They they don't see them. You know, 
but when you look at our legislate when you look at our legislative when you look at our legislative um, power out in this section of thing all of all of western mass doesn't equal a, a, por a portion of right. Boston right. so we don't have the legislative clout to do anything school choice is another thing why why are we putting dollar signs on kids eastern part of the state doesn't have that problem we do and 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 it's kind of hard for us to say because front our union 38 frontier district has has profited i guess i'll i'll say um by it, school it, choice because we we're, we're we're net plus we're you know our schools are, are in union 38 and frontier are net are net plus we get more kids from school choice than we lose so but but where are we taking those we're taking those dollars and we're taking those those parents that are concerned from the schools where they should be and we bring them to here so so trying to get education funded properly or differently um and, and trying to address the school school choice issues you know th those are those are huge issues um i i don't know if we can i don't know if we can take them on independently but i think i think our voice it, it's our voice needs to be heard more on a, on a regional basis um i i and and i i think our budget is is a concern and also not just a budget because I, I think our budget is more or less stable it's the revenues mm -hmm. you know the and and again we're coming to, to the state when you look at what the state how how it reimburses versus the towns it's changed it's it's changed over the, the discretionary you know we used to get pilot pilot funds then all of a sudden the, the Boston area or the eastern part of the state all of a sudden says well hey we have state state lands also right. um, and I don't I don't that's the one and, when, and we originally fought for pilot when Western Mass was was get was getting pilots because you know there are two communities out here that lose 35 40 50 percent of their taxable property because it's under state control so I think we have to. We can't be afraid to 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 bring these inequalities to their attention. Anything else? You hit a soul button right there, and it was like we could go on a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, those are all. Um, some of the issues are unique to Sunderland, but a lot of them are um, affect Western Mass and Franklin County in particular as right. a whole. So it's something we, we really need to think about as a region. Um, no town can stand alone or, or do it all on their own. Yeah, agreed. Well, well I, I mean, you, with other you, towns. You, look, you look how, like, we we have a regional ambulance service that, that we fought that that we fought hard for, but 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 we we're but but it was out of necessity because we had de declining declining volunteerism. Okay, mm -hmm. and and. Yeah. <laughs> It, when you when you look when you look at the amount of hours that you know we just had three volunteer firefighters that went to um, the state uh, firefighting academy and they just graduated from in down in Springfield a couple of weeks ago. They has 240 hours of training that they went through. That's just that's just training. That doesn't that's not including the, the time that they drove down there. That does not the time that they read, but. EMTs, paramedics. When you look at when you know the, the amount of time that they have to um, put in for their 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 continuing education hours, they had to have so many hours in the ambulance and traveling. It's just it's just making it so much more difficult for people to volunteer today. So, and, and that that's a that that's a concern. That's a concern. Yeah, it's, and it's a public safety issue. As well, right. public health issue. Well, and I, I mean, you look at you look at Charmont, Charmont, and 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 Row, and you know the, they're the West County right now trying to trying to get ambulance services very difficult, uh, very difficult, and and 
we, meaning Franklin County, have been lucky that we've had cold rain. Their, their ambulance system is, 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 picks up the slack in a lot of West, West County. But, you know, they, when there was an ambulance service that was in Greenfield, they had the ambulance station in Greenfield. That doesn't make sense to me because the ambulance should be in Ch Charlemont and it should be coming this way, not by the hospital. But we, but there was there the economics just weren't in it for for base or anybody else to put an ambulance in Charlemont. So, so yeah, we and and we have to and and we have to do a better we again have to do a better job of of not selling ourselves short. You know, it is a good place to live. You know, we we need to get. Bring bring broadband into our communities. You know we're lucky in Sunderland. We we have almost 100 percent coverage. But and 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 hopefully we can bring an economic development too. So you don't have so new next town administrator is easy. Yes. <laughs> no. Economic develop economic development. Bring in diversify our tax base. Take care of the education concerns. That's it. Piece of cake. Not a Seems a piece of cake. Piece of cake. I like it. <laughs> well played. Well played indeed. Anything else you want to ask? I, I think that's it. Um, I don't know. Any any last thoughts or questions? Uh, not not off not off the script. No. Okay. Well, that's I, I, uh, I, I, I was I was interested I was when you first were talking about planning and government I thought I liked that 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 was um, we we as a town um, are looking into um, we are working with with a couple other communities on a, on HR because right now. Our HR is all taken care of by the treasurer, and the treasurer may or may not be the best person for, for that job. But it all, everything runs through through the treasurer, and and I would say for the past 25, 30 years, we've talked about um, regional shared planning. We do a lot with a cog, mm -hmm. but what do you do for for the communities? Yeah, the, the, they can solve some of the grant issues and some of the regional projects, but the day-to-day -day really and, and we, isn't and, able to be covered. And, and Peggy Sloan and, and the group does a wonderful job at the car because they they get to look at the big picture, mm -hmm. which someone has to. Um, but when you know we we're, we're limited on 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 what we can do as a as a town, because we don't have a full-time plan, you know. If some, how how do we market ourselves? We we it's almost impossible. Sure. So. You don't have a marketing department. <laughs> what happened to that? <laughs> so if the town. So it would uh, would I be looking for from a town administrator? And we we asked we've been asked this question before. Is, is someone that can that that can can is a person that wears many hats? Someone mm -hmm. that has experience. To, to wear a lot of different hats and you know it can be a manager of people can be a manager of budgets can be a manager of 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 our utilities um ideas manager of ideas because they do come in fast and furious absolutely and 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 and, and, and all of its stuff but the right the right person really makes a difference and I, I think when you go home at night the town the success a successful town administrator when they go home at, at night I think there's a extreme frustration but extreme <laughs> but some but also I think you can have extreme uh, satisfaction also yeah, it's, it's not all ribbon cutting sometimes it's just smiles and a good job from someone you haven't seen in six months yeah absolutely right or, or, yeah. Post, or you know it's just yeah. that simple yeah absolutely Scotty quite interesting anyway you get to see our answers for the last interview you are our last interview believe it or not wow. so um, our process is to take our notes score our notes in the next week and then reach out to uh, people we want to talk to a second time and then our overarching goal is to uh, wrap this up uh, for uh, in place for mid-December first part of January at the latest All right. All right. Just in time for budget. Well, budget budget's already clocking yeah. <laughs> right now.
But it budget season thicker. never ends. That's, never, that's a fallacy. That's true. It's, I, it's I agree with that. Hundred percent. It's invalid. Hundred percent. All right, Sarah. It's been wonderful. FCAT. We can call us out at. Uh, is our motion to adjourn at eight twenty-five? Motion. Second. Motion's made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Three to zero, please.